you need different kinds of personalities to really, really be successful. It's, you know, it, I think it's really hard for a single business owner um, to, to just be super successful kind of on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's not a partner, they've got somebody in the business that's kind of that X factor. Welcome to Now That's It, stories of MSP success, where we dive into the journeys of some of the trailblazers in our industry to find out how they used their passion for technology to help turn managed services into the thriving sector it is today. Dave Wilkison, or Wilkie as his friends call him, founder and CEO of MSP Advisor and a new venture called Instrumental. Mm -hmm. Dave, welcome to the Now That's It podcast. Thanks for having me, Chris. <laughs> so sarcastic. Uh, an entrepreneur, IT leader, school board member, Pilot. Ex scoop. Ex school board member. Is there anything you can't do, Dave? Uh yeah, I can't shoot par mm. in golf. That'll come with practice. You're a member uh, in a beautiful country club yeah. in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh -huh. Old world. Mm-hmm. Very good. I keep practicing and you'll get as good as me someday. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh you went to school for chemical engineering. Let me ask you, have you ever touched a chemical in your career? Oh, I've touched. Oh, in the career? Yeah. No, 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 no never done it. No, nope. <laughs> in college, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but that. So, what, what was so exciting about IT and computers that made you want to start in tech? Well, you know, computers were my hobby, right? Mm -hmm. Like when I when I was young, uh, I did programming. Um, <clears throat> I worked for a company, and we did. Uh, well, it was a couple of guys, right? Mm -hmm. We were writing software for schools. Um, and I, I was having a blast. I mean, I was, a, I was the 16 year old that was able to go out and, and pay cash for a car, you know, a really nice car because I had been working programming mm -hmm. and it was really just a hobby. I, I, I just thought it was, it was super cool. Um, but I never really thought of it as a career It never, it was never really what I, what I pictured myself doing. Uh, my dad was an electrical engineer and he actually transitioned to computer basically an early version of a computer engineer. Hmm. Um, but I, I just, uh, I never pictured myself doing that. It, it was too much of a hobby. I didn't know that about your dad. I, I obviously got to know him. Um, I didn't know that he was, uh, he got you, he was the one that sort of inspired you. Right? Mm -hmm. Mine is the same. Yeah. Awesome. Packard Electric. He, he worked at Packard Electric and uh, he, he was, he ran the only computers they had at the time there. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the early lessons that you learned um, sort of pre-MSP business days? Because you had a couple of different ventures there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one thing I learned uh, in my, my first venture was essentially a computer store, I guess, for lack of a better term. I started actually when I was in college um, and we did, we built PCs, you know, early days. Like this was 89, I think I started this. And you know, I learned a lot of things. I learned, number one, I never wanted to sell to consumers, like residential, bad idea. I learned that you have to be super careful about your money. Um, I had a controller that basically stole a bunch of money from me. Mm. Um, so I, I learned that, you know, you really, you can't just go along and not understand your finances. You, you really have to have a good handle on that. Um, you know, I thought, I just turn this over to this nice lady that knew what she was doing. And that's just a really bad idea. And I learned that, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's not as easy as just kind of focusing on the tech that you really had to kind of learn the business side. And, you know, I wasn't a business guy. My, my parents, my mother specifically had a bookstore. And so I, I had a lot of exposure to all that um, and was interested in it, but that really, I never really thought, I never really focused on that piece. You know, I sort of almost got it as osmosis, hmm. but it was really, you know, it's a critical, it's a critical piece to a business. Sure. What was, uh, you, you were, you've been a multi-time entrepreneur, right? Started several businesses. What were a couple of those early ones that you started? Yeah. So there was the computer uh, mm -hmm. store, you know, we sold the businesses, but we also sold to mm -hmm. residential. We had a storefront, all of that good stuff. Um, somewhere along the way in there, I saw, I guess what we would call now uh, the the next killer app. You know, of course there were no apps at the time, but email. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, this this electronic mail stuff is awesome, and I really saw it in college, right? So I was going to Youngstown State University, and 
you know, it was, it was just a, basically an education thing, right? And I, um, uh, I, I, there was no internet. There were no dial-up internet providers in Youngstown. So I started a separate company kind of behind my computer store, started buying modems and started that up just to do email. Like that was my focus. And quickly the World Wide Web came along and we started doing web stuff. I thought that was super cool. That, that pulled me back to my programming, you know, mm-hmm. from my early days. I'm like, oh, this is, this is awesome. Um, and so uh, we, that's a really growing. I ended up selling the computer company because I wanted to focus on the internet, uh, the, the internet stuff. Um, and we ended up building, you know, a lot of uh, kind of big early web applications for the state of Ohio, for uh, the country of Trinidad and wow. Tobago, um, the city and county of San Francisco. So we were doing work kind of all over the place um, in, this, in these, these uh, web applications, basically, early web applications. Very neat. So 2005, I think, you decided to buy into a small IT services business in Youngstown. Um, what was the opportunity you saw that made you want to not only sort of take your talents there, if I pull a LeBron uh, quote there, but also buy into it. Yeah. Um, what I saw was, uh, it, first of all, they had a data center, which I was kind of enamored really quickly with because the internet, uh, business that I was always run was almost run, you know, like in a closet, almost like the, the, the technology piece. And we ended up moving it to that data center, which is how I kind of got exposed to the guys, um, at, at DRS. And uh, I thought that was super cool. Mm-hmm. You know, that techie in me came out and thought, man, we could really do some cool stuff here. Um, kind of do next level ISP stuff. Um, the hosting, you know, the, the uh, they were kind of playing around with Citrix as a service, you know, in those days. And they were a big Cisco shop. I loved the Cisco gear, Microsoft. And I had basically, I'd, I had sold... At that point, I had sold my ISP to, uh, to a company and had worked for them as kind of part of the deal mm-hmm. and had realized how, how bad an employee I really was and how that is just not, you know. And, and I think that probably resonates with a lot of uh, MSP owners. Uh, in fact, somebody told me that yesterday that they were completely unemployable. Mm. <laughs> so, so we did that. And, uh, you know, I just saw really good possibilities. They were, they were like, I don't know. They were probably like 10 employees, nine employees, something like that, and had a pretty good VAR business, you know, Cisco, Microsoft uh, business, HP, and then the data center. I thought we could do big things. You talk a little bit about your other business owners, just what sort of talents, personalities they had. Mm -hmm. Um, Are we talking all business owners? Just No, no, no. The ones that you, uh, for the MSP that you bought into. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that was pretty cool, actually. So, um, you know, our, our one partner could sell ice to Eskimos. Mm -hmm. Like literally he was so good. He sold managed services to an IT company, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) So, and he did it, I think partially because I told him he couldn't do it. He Mm -hmm. came and he said, Hey, I I think I got an opportunity to sell managed services to this, you know, large, much larger than us, by the way, um, IT company. I'm going why, why would anybody, that's stupid. Why would anybody do that? Mm-hmm. P- particularly because we actually would bid against them. Like mm-hmm. we would go into deals and they would be one of the bidders on the deals. And, uh, and, I, and I was like, uh, you know, you, you can't do this. And a couple of days later, he, he drops the contract on my desk and he's like, we're onboarding those guys. <laughs> so, um, so he was just really, really good um, at sales. Um, and then we had a couple of, of tech, like highly technical guys, mm-hmm. uh, a Microsoft guy and a Cisco guy, mm-hmm. you know, CCIE. Um, and there was just, there were a lot of kind of bones there. And what I, I really didn't realize it at the time, but like what I call now the X factor, like you need different kinds of personalities to really, really be successful. It's, you know, it, I think it's really hard for a single business owner um, to, to just be super successful kind of on their own, mm-hmm. you know, even if it's not a partner, they've got somebody in the business that's kind of that X factor. And, and that was true. You know, I had that happen uh, myself, one of my employees at my computer company um, that was just, you know, he was just a really good salesperson, didn't know it kind of thing and technical. 
and I and I had it happen at the ISP as well. Mm. And it's you need that kind of energy. So we, we had that. Not like I, I didn't really know it at the time. You know, I didn't consciously go, oh, you know, but this is this is the mix that's really gonna work. Mm. Uh, but it was definitely there. So you mentioned that uh, DRS started out, you know, pretty much as a VAR business. Obviously, they had some time and material, doing some service, some projects. But how did the idea of managed services come about? Well, uh, um, my partner was at a conference, a Cisco conference, and Paul Dipple spoke mm -hmm. at the conference. And he came back and he came to my office. He goes, he goes, man, there's this thing called managed services. And you you sell flat rate IT to companies. And I'm like, that sounds really dumb. Like, <laughs> oh, how are you going to figure out the number of hours? Like, what happens when somebody uses 100 hours and somebody uses two? Like, he goes, he goes we're doing this. Like, we got to figure this out. And I'm like, I was, you know, I, I am the eternal pessimist, you know? He's the eternal optimist. He was, and I think that's part of that yin and yang thing too, by the way. And he's just like, oh, we, we can figure this out. We'll just, we can make this happen, right? And I'm like, yeah, this is, ugh. And, but I started looking at it and, and what really attracted me was, you know, when I, when I switched from that computer company uh, to the ISP, the big thing I saw there that made business easier was the recurring revenue. You know, we had, when we were selling that dial-up ISP and the hosting stuff, we had money coming in every month. Mm. You know, it was just, you know, it was, it was right there coming on in. And in the computer company, it was you get up in the morning and you go, okay, I got to sell something today. You know, I got to sell a computer system or I got to sell, you know, this, this business that I've been talking to. I got to close that because I'm not going to make payroll if I don't sell something. Um, and you just don't have that in the recurring revenue. So when Mike, uh, start, my partner started talking to me about that, uh, that was the really attractive piece that made me sort of kind of come over and say, all right, well, we're going to, we're going to kind of look at this seriously and, and try to figure this out. That's great. I think there's another Mike that, um, uh, from enable that came into your life during those early MSP figuring it out days. Mike Cullen, can you talk about the how he the impact that he made on DRS and really the future of that business? Yeah, for sure. So, so Mike Cullen, uh, you know, some people call him the godfather of the industry. So, we had joined a peer group. Uh, uh, it's called True Profit Groups. So we had we had joined a peer group. Um, it's an invitation only uh, group, and and that's kind of where I found the power of working with peers. And we were having a lot of troubles uh, with N Central. Uh, there was a really bad rollout. And, and we're talking, by the way, like version, I think it was like version 2.6. It's kind of burned into my memory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was at a peer group meeting and I was, you know, complaining about, you know, this, this rollout, how much trouble we were having, how much trouble we were having, kind of getting support to kind of get it all figured out, which was mainly because everybody was having, the entire user base was having trouble. And we did a thing in the peer group where a vendor would come and sponsor dinner. And Mike Cullen from Enable came and sponsored dinner. And, um, you know, I was introduced by one of the other guys in the peer group. I started talking. Mike Cullen's, you know, pouring the wine. And he goes, I'm telling him my problems. He goes, we're going to get this solved. And literally, you know, he made a few phone calls and we got this thing figured out. Um, and he became, you know, I would talk to him probably every couple months, um, you know, that entire time. And we would just talk, like he, he would call and say, Hey, you know, he, he would kind of pull a bunch of, uh, companies and say, Hey, you know, we're thinking about this or, you know, we came up with this idea. What do you think? Um, he was just, he was so open to kind of the industry and, and thinking big, mm -hmm. um, just a just a super smart guy, sweet guy. Um, and, and literally, I mean, I, I, uh, I bet I, I talked to him at least annually, if not more, you know, until last year. Mm -hmm. So great guy. Yeah. He was definitely a great influence on so many people in the industry. And, uh, I remember you sharing how he helped, uh, DRS back in the days as well. That's and such great. a strong partnership, mm -hmm. you, you know, like he, he was the guy at enable and then, and then, 
eventually kind of Dave Weeks as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they were the, the guys that, um, you know, if, if there was a problem or, or just a concern or, you know, I remember in the old days um, having a big conversation about integrating with our PSA. Like, um, guys, we got, you got a right to the PSA. It's so critical. And those were the guys that championed that idea in the, uh, in the Enable organization and, and kind of, I think, pushed that through and got it done. So DRS grew organically um, pretty quickly, and thanks to you and the other executives. Did you ever feel you were growing too quickly? Oh, yeah. I mean, as an as a eternal pessimist, you're always, you know, really concerned about, you know, that um, when, you, when you get yourself out there, right, and, and things are maybe not quite as right as they are, you know, the, the eternal optimist says, oh, it's, it's all great. We're going to figure this out. You know, my brain goes through the scenarios. Like that's, it keeps me up at night. You know, I'm, I'm like running the scenarios in my head. And so, you know, you tend to see the bad things and the worst things that can happen along with the good things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, when you're growing quickly, you know, there's, there's part of me that always said, well, you know, I mean, we need to maybe pump the brakes a little bit. Mm -hmm. One of the things though that I've learned over the years is, you you have to be pushed out of your comfort zone to 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 grow and and i'm not talking financially grow because you know we could have just kind of grew slowly you know 10 15 a year comfortably um but i'm talking like when when we would have years of hyper growth 50 60 percent growth it was always uncomfortable mm -hmm. and i realized that that um that that's what makes a company better you know doing doing the things that they're not comfortable, forcing kind of everybody to, to just go, oh man, I, how are we gonna do this? And just roll up your sleeves and figure it out um, and, and make mistakes along the way, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, hopefully not make the clients miserable, sometimes make the clients miserable, but you know, make employees miserable as they're trying to figure it out. Um, that's what in the end, like after you come out of that on the other side, those are the kind of wins that make a company really, really strong. And I think makes employees kind of, it bonds them mm -hmm. um, and really works well there too as, as well. That's great. I'm Speaking of employees, I'm sure you've hired hundreds of employees across your career. Mm -hmm. What are some of the qualities that you would sort of look for in someone that you really didn't know, right? Like during the interview, the hiring process, what are some of those, those qualities that you look for? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big things I look for is somebody that's excited, right? Like they don't necessarily have to be excited about a specific things thing, but you know, has that kind of energy and and you know, really wants to do something different, or or you know, or maybe better than what they're doing. You know, I I tend when I'm doing an interview, and and I do interviews now for, for to help clients sometimes. Um, Mainly because I've done so much, you know, I kind I get a, I really get a strong impression about people quickly in an interview. Mm -hmm. But you know, if they're just kind of laid back doing the interview, kind of just kind of checking the boxes, you know, and they don't have that fire kind of underneath, um, that's always a bit of a red flag for me. Um, but one of the things I've I've learned too is that you've got to think. You, it's hard to generalize an employee across the company. Some, some people do that. And I've, you know, worked with MSPs where they're, they're always looking for the same type of person. And I, and I really think that's a mistake. I think you've got to look at the role, what they want, and then, and then try to find a person, you know, and a personality that fits that. But I think universally you want somebody that's excited, you know, to work, uh, in the, in the environment, in the job, in the company, you know, they, they need to be able to express that. You need to feel it. That's great. I'm sure you've had some good ones, but can you think of maybe your best employee? The you've best ever hired? employee. Well, there was this guy named Chris Massey <laughs> that I hired uh, to help me on the help desk. And by the way, if 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 anybody's talked to Mr. Chris Massey here, the thing that comes out immediately is his excitement for the job and the challenge. And I mean, I guess that goes, and I didn't really plan it like that because I didn't realize you were going to ask that. But, uh, y you know, that that's the thing that initially got my attention about you. Mm -hmm. And I remember distinctly thinking, 
Because I don't, I don't remember what you, I don't think you applied for that job. Did no, you? I wanted to be a sales engineer. Yeah. And Mike didn't want a sales engineer. Yeah. So. And I remember, I remember thinking there's got, we got to come up with a place for this awesome. kid. Cause he's just, he's just, he's got like a fire. And I remember sitting and talking to Mike and going like, what do you think? Like he, he, he's like, wow, we don't, we don't need a sales guy. Yeah. Like, okay. Well, I'm going to figure something out. Yeah. And I remember talking to you and sort of negotiating with you like, Hey, mm-hmm. I can't do what you want, but how about this thing over here? I think it worked out pretty well because uh, it was definitely, I was, my career was heading in a direction. I saw this really cool company again. And I think you were 30 people at the time. Uh, yeah. I don't remember. It was small. And so uh, I saw this cool culture. There's this opportunity to, to come back to Youngstown and, and work in, in Northeastern Ohio. Um, and, and I, yeah, I just saw that opportunity like uh, with a growing company. It was pretty cool. And I learned a lot, right. To be able to say, well, I ran operations eventually. Right. It was, it was well, really you did a lot of different, we moved you around and yeah. then, after I sold, you got moved around again to mm-hmm. marketing, which I always thought was crazy. Oh, that was the best. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so speaking of that, uh, so 2013, I think that was the time uh, when it was time for you to exit and start something new. What's the opportunity that you saw sort of after years of building an MSP? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the interesting thing about that is I did not plan that at all. So when I sold... Um, you know, I have a big farm. I thought, you know, I'd, I'd worked so hard as an entrepreneur for so many years. I thought, and, you know, at that point, I, I had done pretty well. I thought, well, you know, maybe it's time to just kind of mess around with things, see what, you know, comes along. Um, we had just uh, just uh, built a new house, which, you know, uh, my wife was like, so you're not going to work. And we just are mo- like literally... I, I was, you know, still finishing things in the house because I, I did the general contracting on the house. Uh, I, actually, I take that back. That was the second time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the first time that mm-hmm. I was in that. Um, so uh, I was I was kind of puttering around the farm, doing things that needed to be done, and I started uh, getting calls because I posted on LinkedIn, you know, that I had uh, left uh, DRS. And I think the first call I got was from an MSP that had – called me over the years, I, I'm pretty sure, I either met them at an Enable event or a ConnectWise event, and they uh, called me and they said, hey, um, I see you, you know, you're, you're not the COO of, of DRS anymore. You know, we're, we're struggling with some things, and would you mind just, just helping? And I'm like, well, you know, I don't know, okay. And uh, we came up kind of with a deal where I, I charged them by the hour um, and, and work with them, and that was pretty fun. Like mm-hmm. I, I realized that it was, you know, I was able to just focus on solving problems, which is kind of in my DNA, mm-hmm. without having to worry about, you know, the kind of the all the the stuff that kind of comes along with that. Cool. And that kind of started things for me. Um, and then I got some calls from Mike Cullen. He's like, hey, you know, I hear you're kind of helping some some MSPs. Would you would you help this one? I got some calls from ConnectWise. Hey, would you help this one? Um, and uh, it, it just sort of grew. And then all of a sudden I was like, well, okay, I guess this is a business. And, uh, and I guess the rest is history there. So let's talk about how you service the MSP industry today at MSP Advisor. What are, what are some of the ways that you help MSPs? Yeah, so one of the things we do is, is one-on-one consulting and coaching, basically. Mm-hmm. I, I think of it more as coaching. Um, so we, we will typically you know, figure out sort of a, a budget of time that they want to spend. Um, because basically, if, you know, if we're spending an hour, they're spending an hour or more kind of as homework almost. Um, <clears throat> so we do that. Um, we then, we also have peer groups. Mm-hmm. So we have online and in-person peer groups, um, you know, in, in North America and then also in the, in the UK and, and uh, Europe and, and soon Australia which that one's a little challenging from a time perspective. Um, so we do the peer groups. Uh, we, we also uh, do consulting around um, PSA. So we work through, um, you know, basically we've run into so many problems, you know, when we bring a new client on inside the PSA that we felt we had to 
kind of build a practice around fixing that stuff and, mm -hmm. and getting it to a standard. Um, and, uh, and, and we're all, we also do like stack consultation, those kinds of things. So sort of projects, um, uh, bespoke projects around, around those kinds of things. That's exciting. So for the past 11 years, you've worked with MSPs all across the world, as you mentioned, are there any observations you can make about sort of the current state of the MSP industry? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's changing a bit. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think the fundamentals are changing. But I think that we are on a precipice where the the RPA and AI side of things is going to change the the labor component so dramatically and so quickly. I mean, you know, two years ago, I don't think we were even talking about this, mm -hmm. um, and now it's you know I don't I mean I think they're they're talking about it right now over uh, at the Empower session. Um, which says a lot, right, in the industry to have this uh, change so quickly. And, you know, some of the things I'm seeing are taking, you know, onboarding from, you know, an hour a user to 10 minutes. And of the 10 minutes, only maybe two minutes were a human. Mm. And the rest of it was just it takes time to, to do all the steps. And it's doing it perfectly every single time. And if you had a human do it, you know. Mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are some of the common mistakes that MSPs tend to make when they're trying to grow their business? Oh, well, there's a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, I would say the small MSPs, one of the biggest problems are they don't understand their finances, don't understand how to read that. And so everything is done by gut feel. And, and I think it actually is a testament. You know, if a company makes it to, you know, probably 3 million, and, and they haven't focused on the financials, which is, is the majority, because they come from a technical you know, side of, of uh, the house and, and they just, that's just not their background generally. Um, I just think that they, they uh, it's a testament to how well their gut feel works. And then what happens is, then they, they think they can rely, rely on it forever. And the problem is, as you get bigger, you don't know everything anymore. Like you don't know, you may not, you get to the point, hopefully, that you don't even know all the clients. Mm. And once that happens, you know, gut feel relies on essentially having all the information. You know, you may not know you do, or you, you may not know how that works, you know, if you're a very intuitive person, but uh, you've, gotta, you've gotta know everything and, and that all falls apart. Mm. And so what happens a lot of times is, as they're trying to grow and trying to rely on that gut feel, um, they they start making mistakes, and in some cases, really big mistakes. Um, so that that finance component, I think, and really understanding that finance component is is critical. And then, I think the second piece of that is starting to rely on data. So if you want to make decisions, you've got to you've got to understand and have good data, and then also understand what that what good looks like. You know, I, I distinctly remember having a conversation in my MSP before we got into the, the peer group where we, in fact, when I joined, our utilization rate of our guy, our professional services guys, which was, you know, three quarters of the company was um, 31 or 32%. Mm. And, I, and, and two of the partners were professional services guys. So we were, I, re, I remember sitting around there and I going, guys, this isn't enough. And they, they looked at me like I had two heads and going, we're, we're busting our butts here. Like, we, we can't do more. We can't do more billable, right? And um, so I remember saying, well, can we just get it to like 45%? Like, let's make that the goal. Mm -hmm. Well, come to find out once I joined the peer group that 70% is kind of the target right. for that. So you know, not knowing what great looks like, not knowing what good looks like and trying to just make it up based on what at that point was just horrible performance. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought it was bad performance. It was horrible performance. Um, I, you know, I think that's really kind of a critical piece. Mm. So Dave, you have tons of stories over the past number of years, obviously tons of experiences. Have you ever considered writing a book? <laughs> it's funny you should ask, Chris. <laughs> 
we just uh, released a book yep. um, focused on on you know MSPs. Yeah. Oh, you got it there. Yeah, tuck it down. Yeah, yeah. Focused on MSPs and and really um, the I guess the theory of running a managed services company. Um, you know the 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 idea of how to think about your business. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of kind of how tos written for the MSP industry, and we wanted to really focus on something that was more, um, you know, big picture. Like, let, let's think about this because that's really how you drive excellence. I think. Awesome. What's the name of it? It's called Profit and Growth for MSPs: uh, Dragon Boats, Catamarans, and Super Yachts. And I wrote it with uh, Enable Zone Rob Wilburn. Awesome. Um, you know, he focused on the on the growth side of things, the the marketing and so forth, and I focused on kind of the operational and and uh, um, uh, organizational pieces of the of the book. So, any listeners, they can get it uh, on Amazon, right? It is on Amazon right now in hardcover and Kindle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been asked so many times now for an Audible that, uh, and I keep telling Robert we're going to have to record this thing, and he keeps going, oh, because mm. this was, by the way, a ton of work to do. Yeah. So we're awesome. we're gonna record something. That's great. So Dave, what would you tell uh, younger Dave? Oh boy. Well, I would tell younger Dave to buy more Microsoft stock and <laughs> don't sell it because I had a whole bunch of it and I sold it and I should have never done that. I would have told younger Dave to buy Amazon stock. Mm -hmm. So that was probably. I, know, I was thinking more stuff. like like younger Dave from a professional. Oh, group. okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, focusing kind of on the numbers, focusing on the financial side of the business, um, I would sort of reiterate that. I would, have, I would have told me, you know, when you're hiring people, particularly key people, that, you know, worry less about the money, I guess, and worry more about kind of how they – uh, how the, what they're going to bring to the organization. I mean, that's what I do in MSP Advisor now, and it works phenomenally well. Like, you know, I I I want to make sure people make really good money uh, if they are phenomenal people. And and when you surround yourself with with excellence like that, um, you can really do great things. So um, I I would say those are probably the two two big lessons. That's we don't want to take in you know what stocks to to buy. So we call this podcast the Now That's It podcast. So I want to ask you, when did you know Now That's It? Well, what does that mean? It means like, you know, that you were in the right spot. You were doing the right thing. You were helping the oh. right people. Uh, well, I mean, probably. You, you know what it was? I think for MSP Advisor, at least, COVID times. Because that was so stressful for so many companies. You know, I did webinars. I, I had just strings of calls with MSPs that I had never really dealt with that were just, you know, freaking out, like mm -hmm. not, to, not knowing what to do. And, um, you know, I was drawing from my experience in 2007, 2008 with the, you know, the kind of the housing crash and banking crash. Um, and at the end of that, I had so many people say, you know, to me, you know, thanks for the advice. You know, that kind of helped us get through it, that kind of thing. And I, and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm really helping a lot of companies here. And it, it really felt good. Dave, uh, thank you so much for, for, for being here, for talking with me. Uh, I wish you the best of luck. Wish you the best of luck with the book. And uh, have a good uh, rest of the, the, the year here. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. <laughs>